Hey, boys and girls. Hi, we're back again. And uh, today we're going to talk about interiors. Um, so whether you know it or not, there's two things that sell cars. The outside style and the interiors. This is where you spend all your time. This is the things that you touch, the things that you smell, the things that you feel. All that stuff is in here. And the rest of the stuff, like the car starting and the doors closing and uh, it steers well and brakes and whatnot, those are taken for granted type of qualities that you get inside of a vehicle. But really and truly, this is why you buy the vehicle. Now, uh, some people, like Tesla buyers, will be buying it for a different reason. They'll be buying it because it's an EV. Um, and that's the most important thing in their life. So when you're looking at a truck company, though, things are slightly different. With uh, most cars, not trucks, but cars, if you can save weight or you can save money on a, on a product, then what you do is you want to find out how you can put a feature or a function or something that's going to amaze and delight the traditional buyer. These are the things that, that you want to see inside of a vehicle, those things that amaze and delight. Now, there's a problem. There's a problem because the traditional buyer of trucks, he doesn't care. Um, he wants the good old days. And I'm using the he because 99% of the times this is going to be a man. And uh, he's going to say things like, I'm a real man and I don't need that fancy shit. And one of the key phrases I heard when I was at Ford that I never forgot was, um, plastic is for kids' toys, aluminum is for pots and pans, but iron is for trucks. So if we take that thought process and put it in, look at what we've got here in the Tesla Cybertruck, things are radically different. There's nothing wrong with this interior. It's modern, it's uh, functional, and it's clean and clear. Now, the ordinary trucker uh, that would look at this and, uh, and say things like, well, it's not too fancy, that kind of stuff may sell, but at the end of the day, this is gonna sell to somebody else, somebody else who's a little bit on the more modern side. I think that, uh, I think that what we need to do is we need to think about what's that old time trucker going to say when he looks at this. So again, I said that the, um, the, the product, the, the Tesla product is different than everything else. And it's not really a pickup truck. It's something else. And we're going to discuss that as we go through the interiors. And uh, last, again, a blast from the past. Let's keep on trucking. So what we're going to do is we're going to start talking about uh, the interior. We're going to start with the instrument panel and uh, you just have a look inside there and it looks kind of like a car instrument panel. There's very little difference actually. And, uh, and I can tell you uh, again, because I'm old, uh, I can tell you what the instrument panels used to look like on a truck. First off, they were made out of steel, not the fancy leather. They had uh, three instruments. You had a speedometer, a gas gauge and an oil pressure gauge. Because in the old days, engines used to leak oil just about as fast as you'd, you'd fill up your oil and you'd fill up your gas tank at the same time. Old, old instrument panels and old interiors were vastly different. I don't remember any uh, carpet in any pickup truck I saw when I was a kid. If, uh, if a guy was fussy or the farmer's wife or anybody that owned one of these things was fussy, sometimes they'd throw an old, uh, an old uh, a bath towel or something on the floor and quite frankly a lot of the floors like people use the term floorboards they were made out of wood and if there was rust coming through and it usually did rust well then uh, the farmer would just throw another piece of steel on top of it or they throw something cardboard whatever <laughs> pickup trucks in the olden days were vastly different than they are now so now let's start with a with with what happens on the floor here now we've got carpet goes right up underneath the uh, instrument panel. And they'll all have dash panels like this. This is the kind of stuff that, uh, that you put, the mat you put in up against the, uh, the uh, front of dash there to knock down the noise. Truckers today are a little bit different than they were in the olden days. So let's actually now talk a little bit about, um, a little bit about the instrument panel itself. 
Maybe we can zoom in a bit. So the instrument panel on the Ford, this is an older version, uh, it's an older car, and it's gonna be probably refreshed here shortly, but at the end of the day, you've got a lot of things that just look like a car. You've got uh, an instrument panel with traditional dials in it. They put in a little tiny uh, screen there so uh, you can try and feel jazzy. But all these things, all these bits and pieces are pretty standard uh, with what you'd find in a car. The other thing that you'd find about a modern truck versus an older one is the gaps. These gaps are tight. The, the leather here is uh, pretty spectacular. All this stowing and stitching. These, these guys have really put a lot of effort in trying to make the styling so that it's uh, is as good as it can possibly be. So we look at the Tesla Cybertruck and you can see that uh, the instrument panel here looks vastly different. It's uh, got clean lines. We call that an exposed technology or exposed design. Um, its uh, strategy is uh, minimalistic and like I said before, that doesn't bother me. And actually when you think back, when I talked a little while ago, the old truck drivers, um, they didn't really want to have a whole lot on that, uh, on that steering, or sorry, that instrument panel either. So we look at this and we've got, uh, they have a marble look. It's uh, basically compressed paper. Uh, I'm not sure how they get that look. It may be printed on. There's a lot of different ways that you can try things. So let's have a look at, um, at what, we, uh, what we know to be true for uh, some products. This is off of BMW. So the outside here is using natural fiber, in this case bamboo. And that is glued to a piece of aluminum. Let me pull this out of it. That's, made, that's glued to a piece of aluminum. Then you've got a intermediate uh, fiber that goes in here. And then it goes to a plastic backing. This is kind of a, an arduous kind of a deal. Uh, but that's how, if that didn't have leather on it, it had wood, this is kind of how you put it together. And then if, uh, if this has some kind of a fiber backing, it could look something like this. This is using something called Kniff. It's a, um, it's a natural fiber. Um, actually, I, th I think it's from the hemp family. And um, it grows like weeds. And uh, in no time flat, you can have a crop of this stuff. You uh, cut it down, crush it up, dry it out, and, uh, and voila. You use this with some polymers so that, uh, so that you can get the form to stay where it's supposed to. And uh, actually, this is exposed trim from the BMW i3. So what I'd like to do is tell you that when it comes to the door panels and when it comes to the instrument panels, they are not made in the factory. They're always made by tier one factories. Tier one factories are guys that uh, in most cases <laughs> make more money than the OEMs make. They, uh, they build up products like that so that uh, what can happen is these things would be made to suit the car that's going to be built. And so they have a build strategy that goes a long, long way. It goes all the way back to the folks that are making these components, but also the little components that are inside. So you've got tier ones, tier twos, and tier threes. Tier ones are the guys who would be the, uh, they're, they're, they're gonna be the orchestrator. They're gonna be the final finished product. Tier twos would supply things that are systems that fit inside, like uh, speakers and things like that. And uh, tier threes, Tier three would be a guy who's uh, supplying materials. That's how this is made. Tier one, tier two, tier threes. Then, about a, a week beforehand, they'll be told what the build schedule is going to be. So it matches the seats, the seat colors. It matches the, uh, the uh, in some cases, the, uh, the body color so that they match up continuously. So you've got a variety of different levels of trim, all kinds of stuff that goes along with it. It costs a lot of money. Uh, to get all of those fancy features put into something like this. If we look at the door trim panel over here, we don't see a heck of a lot. This is a very clean, uh, simple design, and it'll probably be just like the rest of the Teslas. <clears throat> the rest of the Teslas, 
in that um, you get any color you want as long as it's the one that they're selling. So they're not going to be they're not going to be showing you uh, dozens of different colors and trims and whatnot. And this is why uh, these two components here can probably be uh, uh, probably built inside. So a tier one supplier might be supplying this, and it may have a substrate underneath it. <clears throat> but you could also Tesla could build it on their own because it's so simple. These kinds of things are the things that make uh, car companies a lot more money. Vertical integration, as long as it's simple, that's a great way to go, and that's one of the Tesla strategies and strings. Now, I did have one thing I don't like, and being as uh, the instrument panel is carrying it, I don't like that steering wheel. Okay, I do a lot of off-roading, and I'm telling you what, I'm looking for every place I can stick my hand. This is great for uh, maybe road racing, I, I, I had a steering wheel like that when I was uh, road racing uh, Formula Ford, but I don't think I want that kind of a steering wheel if I'm going off-road and I'm trying to do it in a hurry. I want, uh, I want a full steering wheel. With that, I think uh, we've uh, pretty much uh, exhausted what we can do about uh, or talk about as far as instrument panels, so let's move on to the next topic. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to move on to the seats. They've got one two, three. Now there's a little bit of an optical illusion in here, but there are three seats here. Over in the back, we've got three more seats. So their, their standard is a six-seater. A six-seater um, has uh, two seats, uh, this one and that one, and they're called uh, jump seats. Now, it's not really a fair comparison for this seating arrangement because all of the other truck companies have um, six seats, but it's usually in a lower end vehicle. So one of the things that someone asked is, where did the term jump seat come from? That came from um, World War II, actually. Um, paratroopers were uh, brought in to jump out of these planes. Uh, DC-3s is what they were. Um, they would jump out of the planes, and, uh, but they'd need to sit down for a little while. But as soon as they needed to get out of the plane, these things had to fold up. Obviously, they're paratroopers, they're jumpers. So the term jump seat came from those, uh, those paratroopers. Later on, it was incorporated into, um, into commercial aircraft, and they still use them today. They're extremely uncomfortable, uh, but, uh, but they're used today. And then from there, the, in the 50s and 60s, they started putting jump seats into cars and trucks. So if we look here, we can see that the trim level here is uh, fairly simple. It's got some piping and whatnot. We're pretty sure that they're going to have vented uh, leather or something uh, to, uh, to make it so it's comfortable inside. But they're, they're a very simple, plain, and, and angular. Everything here is nice and, well, it's not nice for some people, but for me, uh, angular. It's a very, uh, very masculine look. So let's go over here and have a look at the RAM. You can see that, first off, it's very, very, very well done. I mean, uh, when you look at the stitching and you look at the pattern work and whatnot, they've really done their job. And if we look down here, you can see that they've used French stitches on below the piping. Even where you can't normally see it, they've added uh, extras, if you like. Okay, so now let's have a look at the RAM console. First off, this thing is huge. Um, and uh, it's got the things that you'd expect, cup holders, things for coins and uh, loose change and whatnot. The one nice feature here is that this thing moves. I can uh, move it closer or further away. And with the lid down, uh, with the normal lid down, I can, uh, I can basically put a huge amount of stuff in here. Plus I've got spaces for other little flat things. So I know that uh, my wife would like that because it's a good place to store your purse. These, these kinds of little features are, are what people are looking for and, uh, and they kind of expect when you're looking at uh, one of these higher end trucks. By the way, <clears throat> when you go and have a look at a truck, uh, you should look for Easter eggs. There's one in here and uh, you can go and find it on your own. Let's go over and have a look at the Ford. So now let's have a look at the, uh, at the 150. Now this is a $75,000 truck. Uh, I'd expect a lot more and I'm getting it. So the seats are comfortable. This leather is like, I don't know, made out of kit or something. Anyway, right here you can see again, 
this type of stitching, friend stitching or double needle stitching, it's kind of uh, difficult to do, and it, and it, but it really makes a nice look. And Ford has decided to go to a two-tone product, so not my style, but, uh, but lots of people like it. But again, this has got a lot of luxury built right into it. This feels like it's, uh, it's worth $75,000. let us have a look at the console for the Ford. First off, um, I'm surprised that this has still got a gear shift. Almost everybody now has gone to either push buttons or a little dial or something like that. The cup holders are okay, but if I'm driving, I'm going to want that one. And uh, my wife is shorter than me. She's going to want that one as well. So I like the other deal where they're both in line. Let's look at uh, the console itself. Nicely appointed. It's comfortable. Put your elbows on. And um, I mean, you got enough room in here to store a, a bad kid. Okay, so now we're looking at the Chevy Silverado. And I'm going to tell you right now, we had to do two takes on this because when I started looking at it closely, uh, I was kind of shocked and I didn't know exactly what to say. This, this trim level doesn't compete with the Ford or the, uh, or the Ram. Um, it, does have, um, it does have some uh, nice stitching and whatnot, but it's not, as, um, it's not as dressed up as I would expect from a car that's, or a truck rather, that's this expensive. I'm, I guess I'm a little bit disappointed. Um, and it's got very, very hard leather, a very hard seat. Okay, so um, I'm in the other side, and uh, this time I'm sitting down, and this is really a hard seat, really hard. I, I don't understand the rationale, but this is a very hard seat. And one of the things that we just noticed is this is a kind of a split line that I would not expect to see. I don't know why they've got a split line here, but, um, I mean, they're expecting you to see this wood grain here, but they're not expecting you to see this split line. Um, I'm, I'm not as pleased with this truck as the other two. Let's have a look at uh, what we're here to see. So first off, there's no, um, there's no shifter or whatever in the way. Um, they've got it on the column, which is uh, what they used to do in the olden days. A lot of people used to have it on the tree. So let's have a look inside here and, um, and uh, we'll, we'll see what we've got. And in essence, what you've got is one gigantic cave. Plunk. No, no features, no nothing in here except for your cell phone and whatnot, but, um, but this is very, very plain inside. Again, I, I, I don't know, I kind of expect uh, little doodads when, um, when I'm, I'm looking at a truck like this for this kind of money. I, I, I just, I think there should be more somehow. Uh, but uh, GM is still in third place and, um, and maybe that's, uh, that's comfortable for them. I don't know. Anyway, let's move on. Okay, we're going to briefly talk about the HVAC system. These trucks, like all uh, cars in North America, have the same kind of HVAC system. So there's no point in pointing out something that you've already seen. So, but when you look at uh, the, uh, the Cybertruck, I don't see that line that they had before that would give you the HVAC that, uh, that would be similar to the, to the Model 3 and the Model Y. But I'm guessing that it's somewhere in there, or maybe this is just a prototype and it wasn't part of the uh, styling, uh, styling uh, uh, journey. So we'll just think that it's probably the same as the 3 and the Y. And my guess is that they're going to be lessons learned from the S, the X, the 3, and the Y. And those lessons learned are going to go inside this vehicle. So I'm assuming that they're going to have the uh, octo valve and the heat pump and all the other little gems that we liked when we tore apart the Model Y. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about safety and, uh, and restraints. So first off, all safety, all safety in all vehicles is regulated by NISHTA and IIHS. NISHTA is in charge of the standards. They say that these things should happen. IIHS is in charge of the testing and, uh, and they do a pretty good job. We talked a lot about what we do with the uh, testing and stuff like that inside of a car. And, and actually in episode 38 of the, uh, of the Tesla Model Y, you can watch us uh, blow up uh, uh, an airbag and, and you can see how quickly it happens and what kind of, uh, what kind of things can, uh, can happen for the, for the occupants and how it protects them. 
We also talk about the other parts of the restraints, the seat belts and whatnot. So we're not going to go through that again. If you want to see that, go there. We did notice here, though, there's, uh, there's no, um, no ATL uh, that we can see on this product. It might be because, um, uh, because that's the way it, because it's a prototype and, or maybe that's the way they've decided to look at it. So at the end of the day, we're, we're not sure what it is going on here, but we're going, to, uh, we're going to just assume that because it's a prototype, it doesn't have anything. By the way, the newest trends out there are to try and make it so that the, um, uh, if you do have um, an airbag event, it doesn't destroy the whole inside of the car. That's, uh, that's coming up. So these are the things that, uh, that we know about, and I'm sure that Tesla's going to have crashworthiness. Uh, I know they're not going to release a car that isn't going to be able to uh, withstand all of the problems associated with IIHS uh, testing. But, uh, but we're going to... Um, we're going to assume that um, they're, they're going to pass. So let's talk about the safety rating. Okay, so there are five stars that are potentially given out uh, uh, by IIHS, and those five stars are what everybody, uh, they try and strive for. Unfortunately, the Chevy, uh, the Chevy Silverado uh, didn't make out so well. Uh, they only have four stars, and that's because of a SORB test on the passenger side that, where it failed. And we think that was because of the battery. The battery that they had in the car act like a little bit of a battering ram. The Ford 150 is uh, five stars, and so is the Ram. So these uh, these uh, these regulations and uh, and the way the the design of the vehicle is implemented, that's going to be the contributing factor to what's going to happen to the uh, the Cybertruck in the future when it goes through uh, proper testing. Let's move on. Okay, so now we're going to talk a little bit about the electronics, and basically that all boils right down to one thing, right here. The screen that you're looking at is the, uh, is the world beater, if you like, and RAM has it. That thing is um, that thing's a 12-inch infotainment and basically everything else kind of screen. It does a lot. This is uh, a lot better, like I say, than the Ford or the GM. We're not even going to waste time uh, talking about that because they're, they're relatively old and there's nothing revolutionary. This is as close as we can get using a truck uh, example uh, to what we would see inside of a Tesla. Very good, like beats the daylights out of everybody else, but still it doesn't have the big screen that the Tesla does. But the one thing that they've done to help out uh, some folks who are not really touchscreen uh, savvy is uh, you can see that they've got push buttons along the side. My guess is that uh, in the next styling review, they'll be disappearing. I, I think they only put them out here for the guys who uh, need so a little coaching and whatnot. If we look up here, um, you're looking at a standard rear view mirror. And in the Tesla, we're gonna be looking at a camera that, uh, that basically looks like a mirror, but really is a, is a camera in the back of the truck. So let's talk about the uh, Cybertruck's uh, digital mirror. Um, first off, the, uh, the digital mirror is uh, also in, the, uh, in a couple of the GM products, but it's on the very, very high end. The, uh, the problem with some digital mirrors is that uh, some people have troubles focusing. They look through the glass, they look through the front screen, windscreen, and then they look up at the mirror and their eyes change their focal, uh, focal array in a little bit, and it takes a second or two to get whatever you need to get, and then you look back out the the, the windscreen and, uh, and you're again changing. These kinds of little problems, um, I'm sure they're gonna work out eventually, but, uh, but in uh, a case of one of the people that, uh, that we know who bought it on a vehicle, um, they didn't really like it because it caused them to uh, uh, lose a second or two while they're driving. So the digital mirror is a good idea. It's probably uh, the way that things are gonna be coming in the future. Okay, so let's have a quick summary. We talked about the, uh, the interior, we talked about the instrument panel, the consoles, the, the seating, the, the safety and the electronics. So let's just wrap it up quickly. Um, first off, the, uh, all of these products appeal to a different group of individuals. Um, and those groups are going to be catered to as long as they think that there's some kind of a market. 
So what we're looking at here with the Cybertruck, we call those pioneers. These are pioneers. They're, 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 in the, uh, they're in the mode where they want to see the future, and the future is right now, and I want to have one of those. The Ram is what we would call a fast follower. They've, uh, they've eliminated a lot of the componentry that you'd normally see in an older style truck. They've put little push buttons right next to the big screen that basically sets them apart from everybody else. They're basically following some of the stuff that Tesla has done, but they're, they're making sure that their, their customers can make the transition by putting the little, little extra buttons and whatnot inside. The others are what we would classify as, as, uh, as settlers. So Ford and Chevy have looked at their customer base and said, you know what, we're selling a lot of these cars right now. Why should we move to something else that might maybe upset these guys? Let's just stay where we are, and uh, they will stay where they are until the market diminishes or, or people, uh, people start to say that they want some of these features. When that happens, then they'll change. So that's, uh, that's kind of the way the automotive industry works, and uh, we've given you a little treat of, or a little taste, I guess, of, of what the, uh, the three vehicles look like from an interior standpoint. So right now what I'd like to do is wrap this up, and uh, again, I'd like to tell you or ask you, if you're into uh, designing anything, if you have any kind of a product that you'd like to have analyzed, redesigned, whatever, let us know. Monroe and Associates does it for a living, and you can get to us on sales at leandesign.com. And again, uh, let's not forget those cashiers and whatnot. We're still, in, uh, still wearing masks, so we're still in a little bit of a problem, so help those cashiers out by giving them a tip. Thank you all, and uh, we'll, be, uh, we'll be talking to you next time.